The media will often grab onto the one story that comes out every now and then of someone who's been in a coma for 10 years and then suddenly reawakens and they make it out to be like it's all sunshine and rainbows and the best thing since sliced bread. But what really is the realistic prognosis for long-term coma patients? Where are they kept all this time? And what does the term coma even mean? Before we begin, we post death and dying related videos every Friday. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, consider subscribing to the channel. Now let's talk long-term coma patients. Now I'm aware this is a death adjacent subject, but let me assure you I have a point other than it simply being quite interesting. It is yet another reminder to write your advanced care directive, to talk to your family about what you do and do not want and the same for them. And to remind you just how much TV and movies have warped our perception of death and dying, often leading to strong death denial. So keep that in mind as we take a look. What is a coma? The title says coma patients, but there are different levels of coma, which isn't a diagnosis by the way. You don't get diagnosed with coma. Coma can be defined as a state of depressed consciousness where the person is unresponsive to the outside world. The usual immediate effect of brain injury is the loss of consciousness. And this could last for a few seconds, like when you get a concussion, to a few weeks to years, depending on the trauma your brain has suffered. And while the term brain injury usually refers to when you take a knock to the head, like you've been in a car accident or a sporting collision, where it is termed a traumatic brain injury, there is also non-traumatic brain injuries, which can lead you to being in a coma, which can often result from stroke or drug overdose, alcohol poisoning, infection of the brain, diabetes complications. There are different levels of coma, ranging from the very deep, where the patient shows no response or awareness at all, to shallower levels, where the patient responds to stimulation by movement or opening their eyes. Still shallower levels can occur, where the patient is able to make some response to speech. Recovery from coma is a gradual process, starting with the patient's eyes opening, then responding to pain, then responding to speech. People don't just wake up from coma and say, where am I, like they do in the movies. The length of the coma is one of the most accurate predictors of the severity of long-term symptoms. The longer the coma, the greater the likelihood of residual symptoms, particularly physical disabilities. A small number of people sustain a brain injury so severe that although they emerge from coma and have sleep-wake cycles, they have no conscious awareness of themselves or their surroundings. If this condition persists for more than four weeks, they can be classified as being in a continuing vegetative state. If it continues for 12 months after a traumatic brain injury or six months after a non-traumatic brain injury, a person can be classified as being in a permanent vegetative state. If the person shows no signs of recovery at this point and staff and family members agree, then it is possible to gain a court order to withdraw treatment. And while we're here, let's define brain death. And we'll do so quickly because we do have a whole video explaining what it is if you wanna know more, and we'll link that in the description. Brain death is defined as the irreversible loss of all functions of the brain, including the brain stem. The three essential findings in brain death are coma, absence of brain stem reflexes, and apnea. In most states and countries, a patient determined to be brain dead is legally and clinically dead. The only thing stopping them from decomposing on the spot is the machines that they are connected to. How TV lies to you. You absolutely can survive being in a coma. Indeed, doctors will often put patients with brain injury into a medically induced coma so their brains can rest and heal, which is what the body and brain is trying to do when it does it itself. Basically, the brain is telling the rest of the body to sit down, shut up, I'm dealing with a crisis up here and I don't want to hear your complaints while I'm trying to fix the issue. However, when you see a coma patient on a TV show, they tend to have these sudden wake-ups and they're instantly talking to their loved ones with no sign of brain injury, except of course the compulsory bandage around their head. It's like they've just had a big sleep and now they're all refreshed. Which is a bit odd considering who is completely alert and awake first thing in the morning when they wake up anyway. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is when it comes to the media and coma is the miraculous recovery. There will be the headlines and I quote, coma patient alive after 10 years asleep. Yes, that is a headline that I saw in a US newspaper during my research. There is so much wrong with that title, you have to laugh because seriously, I almost choked in my coffee when I first read that. That is quality journalism right there, folks. <laughs> 
Now, in all seriousness, this does go to show how misinformed people are about what a coma actually is. My point is that every now and then, the media will put out a story of the one person who comes out of a coma after such a long period of time. So the public start to believe that coma is just a long-term sleep that patients eventually come out of. But the media never shows the thousands of long-term patients who never come out of it. And thus, false hope and denial are commonplace when doctors try to explain to families their loved one's reality. And it leaves these families open to manipulation, which brings us to the next point. Patient warehousing. Most countries have laws in place to withdraw treatment of a patient if keeping them alive is inhumane, of which keeping someone alive who's in a vegetative state for 10 years would qualify. But the US, they do things differently, combining all life is sacred with capitalism at its finest. So we can all understand that the purpose of a hospital is to cure or fix patients and have them move out as quickly as possible so that new patients can come in. That's not a bad thing, that's exactly what they're supposed to do. Now because of this, you can't have a patient taking up a bed for 20 years. In that time, hundreds of patients could have been in that bed getting care. And that's just one long-term coma patient. Which is why separate rehabilitation and long-term care facilities exist. Now before we move on, let's be absolutely clear here. If you've just crashed your motorbike, knocked your noggin, and you're in a coma for a few weeks, you're not going to one of these places. Hospital turnover is quick, yeah, but it's not that quick. If you are showing any signs of improvement or change, you will be kept at that hospital as long as is needed. It's when there is months or years of no change, no improvement, that you will be moved to one of these places. Now, all countries have these facilities, though they are usually a mix of patients, including those in coma, but also those who are aware, alert, and recovering from a stroke or a brain injury or something else entirely. Many of these facilities are public facilities, meaning they are funded by the government. But like we said, the US does things differently. Sure, they have a few of these public facilities and they are the ones that you can easily find out about online and with a quick phone call. Then there are the private facilities or the facilities attached to private hospitals, calling themselves rehab or long-term care facilities. But in reality, they are warehousing patients like cargo. Think of a huge building with row after row of patients that are in complete silence other than the beeps of machines. Now, these places are not well known at all. They don't publicly advertise. In fact, there is hardly any information on them at all. And that is how they like it. So how do they get patients and frankly, stay in business? Well, they are the vultures in suits stalking the hospital hallways for coma patients' families, promising that their rehabilitation center will make it all better preying on people's hope and denial. They are the ones giving kickbacks to severely underpaid medical staff who refer patients' families to their services. These families are desperate for their loved ones to recover, and they are more likely to hold on to the idea that this magic place can save them than listen to what the doctors are telling them. And like we said in a previous video, those who are extremely religious often fall very easy prey to this kind of marketing because suddenly this vulture in a suit is talking miracles. Now, of course, these places don't say that their loved ones will be in there forever because that doesn't sell. Rather, they tell the families about all the miraculous recoveries in their facilities and how their loved ones will be recovered in no time. So the family agrees and the patient is sent to the facility. Months go by, it turns into years. But they have already put in so much time and money, they figure just one more month, just one more month. Then they stop visiting because life goes on, but they keep paying because sunk cost fallacy and all that. And remember, this isn't cheap. Families go into extreme debt for this. But the facility will keep reaffirming hope, so the family keeps paying. And when you have 50, sometimes 100 patients whose needs are very basic, electricity, yes, but the minimum food or medical staff, you can see how this would make for big business. From a business perspective, it is genius. And if you are wondering what kind of person would create such a business, studies show many CEOs would qualify as psychopaths or narcissists. So that kind of answers that one. And what's worse, is that these clinics will often purposefully confuse families, telling them that someone can wake up after such a long time in a vegetative state. Or worse, that they can wake up after brain death. So it's worth admitting to them to the facilities, right? And they know damn well that that won't happen. 
But let's say, hypothetically speaking, some miracle comes about and a patient who has been in a coma comes back into consciousness after 10, 15, 20 years. Then what? Prognosis after long-term coma. So say the family has prayed to whatever God it is they believe in and their loved one has come out of a coma after being in one for 10 years. Let's say they were 18 when they initially sustained the injury and they're now 28. Without even looking at the medical part of all this, here's what that person is facing. They haven't finished their education, they have no employment history, and with how much technology has changed over 10 years, it is unlikely that they will ever catch up with that. Their social development has been stunted, so their social skills will be at best that of an 18 year old. Also, it's been 10 years. Friends and family have moved on in life. Their mates who they were just parting it up with in what seems like the blink of an eye are now married, have kids, have careers, and you don't really know them anymore. Or let's say the person was 25 when they sustained their injuries and they come out of it at 35. Likely at 25, they would have just been staying to establish their career. Now they have a 10 year gap. And anyone who has applied for a professional job nowadays knows that they want you to have 10 years experience at 18 years old. Harsh but true, you at 35 won't be getting hired, at least not in anything that pays well. Also, likely you were in a solid relationship at 25. At 35, that partner has likely moved on. And if you had a kid at 25, they likely would have been really young. Now they'll be in their late teens and they don't know you and you don't know them. Then there are all those around you. They have kept living their lives in one way or another. They have gotten older and people change. Think of how different you were 10 years ago to now. You have to get to know each other again. And then there is the cost. 24 hour medical care for 10 years, that is a debt you are never getting out of. And who's paying for that now that you're conscious? Are your parents continuing to pay? Your partner? Do you need to pay for it now? And with what job? And that's all forgetting the medical side of things. Because medically, you might be conscious, but contrary to what the media says, things don't suddenly go back to normal. Even if the nurses did do daily rehab with you while you were in coma, after that long of a period, the effects of pressure sores, blood clots, ulcers, urinary tract infections, atrophy of muscles, scarring of the esophagus are all going to impact your life now. And that's just from the coma. That doesn't include the effects of the initial injury, the stroke or traumatic brain injury that you now need to recover from. Because coming out of coma doesn't mean you've recovered. It just means you came out of the coma. You are now just well enough to stay conscious. And it is at this point that things become really tough because your family has had 10 years of nothing happening. They have dreamed, or at least they've told themselves, they have dreamed of you coming back to them, but they haven't planned for it. Indeed, after 10 years go by, anticipatory grief has probably already come and gone and they've made peace on some level with you being gone. And this miraculous recovery brings huge challenges. After the celebratory, yay, they're awake stage, reality sets in pretty quick. And notice how the media only focus on the initial stage. We don't usually see them go back and talk to the family a year later. This person is likely going to need around the clock care. So for family, that means no more living their lives. They either now put things all on hold and focus all their time and effort on caring for you, or they send you to an actual proper rehab facility. That means more debt. The patient's parents are now likely elderly or at least thinking of retirement. When they should have been off traveling or at least giving up work, they will now be full-time carers and not enjoying their golden years. And this is often where resentment kicks in on both sides. The family quickly gets compassion fatigue and burnout. They are in debt. They are caring for someone whose personality has likely changed due to the head injury and usually not for the better. And the patient has lost everything. Most of their friends and relationships are gone and they are stuck with no independence, knowing that even if somehow they do recover, it will likely take at least 10 years to have any kind of independence, but they will probably never be able to live by themselves again. The media always shows the person coming out of it as happy and thanking God for a second chance of life. Of course, they never show those who are angry at their situation. They never show those who are angry or feel betrayed by their family for not turning off the machines and letting this be their future. Now this situation would never happen to you, right? It would never happen to your friend or family member, right? But what makes you so special? 
so impervious to harm that it would never happen to you. Because I guarantee you, those thousands of people, and that's in the US alone, many more outside of that, would also have said that. Kids don't go to music festivals thinking they're going to OD. Parents don't drive to work thinking they're going to get T-boned by a drunk driver. No one is sitting watching TV thinking they're about to have a stroke. And yet we hear about these incidents on the nightly news all the time. And there is nothing stopping it from being you or someone you know. You need to have this discussion with your family. And if you don't know how to discuss it or what situations you need to plan for or how to write the advanced care directive, book an online consult with us and we can help you look at all the angles and prepare your directive and what to say to your family. That is what we're here for. And with that, go talk death.